Uh, welcome back all uh, to IPDPS, and it is my uh, wonderful uh, task, doesn't seem like a task at all, to introduce for you this morning uh, Jason Kong. Uh, Dr. Kong is the Volgano Chair for Engineering Excellence Professor at the UCLA Computer Science Department. He holds a joint appointment with electrical the Electrical Engineering Department and is the Director of Center for Domain-Specific Computing, the Director of VLSI Architecture, Synthesis, and Technology Laboratory. Dr. Khan's research interests include novel architectures and compilation for customizable computing, synthesis of VLSI circuits and systems, and highly scalable algorithms. He has over 500 publications in these areas. See you graduate students, get moving, uh, including 15 best paper awards, three 10-year most influential paper awards, and the first paper inducted to the FP, FPGA and Reconfigurable Computing Hall of Fame. He and his former students co-founded Auto ESL, uh, and they developed the widely used uh, high-level synthesis tool for FPGAs. Uh, he was also the founder of A Plus Design Technologies, Neptune Design Automation, and Falcon Computing Systems. He was elected to an IEEE Fellow in 2000, ACM Fellow in 2008, the National Academy of Engineering in 2017, and the National Academy of Inventors in 2020. Dr. Kong. Thank you very much, Karen, for the introduction. Um, also, I want to thank the committee for um, both inviting me to give the keynote and also giving me the flexibility. I was originally scheduled to speak last year, and I very much I'd like to be here in person, so I asked to be postponed to this year. I was hoping the pandemic would be long over by then, but uh, it was unfortunately it's not the case. Uh, but I'm here, uh, glad to meet everyone and uh, uh, virtually. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to tell you my uh, now experience to go from uh, uh, parallelization to customization and also the challenges and the opportunities. When we talk, uh, so we have three parts. We talk, first talk about the why we do customization and uh, what are the challenges and uh, what are the opportunities. My goal is really trying to engage the uh, members in this community, try to look at the problems, interesting, challenging, exciting problems in this space. So when we talk about customization, uh, the most successful example probably is the Google TPU announced recently uh, right, the first version was done 2014, and um, uh, there's a revised version 2017 still uh, being updated. Uh, I know that the TPU4 just came out recently, but if you look at the, the publication in ISCA 2017, um, this is a remarkable, it has a remarkable performance about 200x in terms of the performance power over the leading edge CPU at that time and the 70X um, performance power um, advantage over um, the GPU uh, at that era, right? The both CPUs, GPUs and uh, TPUs have been improving in the last few years. So these numbers uh, may not be exactly of the same ratio, but it, certainly you can see the advantage uh, from a customization. However, there are a couple of limitations. One is that the, if you are Google, you can do this. It takes a, a team of engineers, uh, somewhere between 12 months to 18 months to do the design, validate, fabricate, and uh, to get a working parts. Um, so it costs a lot of money. And also it costs time to build during this one to two years, the algorithm has been advancing. So there's cases uh, the, which probably new algorithm come up, it's no longer suitable for a, a fixed platform to accelerate. And so I call this the rich man solution. And uh, what I'm interested in this talk is to talk about the customization for the masses. Everybody uh, in this community got to be able to design your favorite uh, customized accelerator. How do you do that? Uh, you can make use of FPGAs. Many of you probably are familiar with the FPGAs. SPG stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. If you look inside, and uh, the most flexible part is the uh, configurable uh, lookup tables. That, uh, so basically it's a, a lookup table of a two to the K elements. And remember any K input function, um, they will have a, a lookup table size of um, 
of a two to the K, right? So this can implement any K input Boolean functions. And they also had a, a number of dedicated uh, elements. Uh, first, they have a, uh, multipliers, for example, this all here. Um, you don't have to build it ground up using lookup tables. Um, they have memories that uh, they are here, um, and then have IO that are for high-speed IOs. Uh, moreover, they have a, a island scale, the, the island style, the reconfigurable mesh routing, so you can, compare, uh, can connect one logic to another logic or one memory to another multiplier. Um, this is all done in your office on your desk because all of them are controlled by uh, SRAMs. Uh, can be customized in seconds. And uh, obviously the shortcoming is that uh, with this customization, you lose some density. Uh, I estimated somewhere around 5X and also you lose uh, uh, clock frequency somewhere between let's say 3X or so, right? Um, uh, you can think it's a significant overhead, but I will come to show you that when we come to customization, the advantage is so high, typically it's in the order of 100x, 1000x, and that we can easily overcome these shortcomings. Um, the nice part is that, that this is something everyone can do in your office, on your desk, in a matter of hours, days, and all weeks. Uh, depends on the complexity of your design. Um, so you can say, where do I get an FPGA? Uh, the same place you can use GPUs. For example, if you go to Amazon AWS, they have a, a, a class of uh, instances called F1 instance. They support FPGAs. Uh, the FPGA they have is actually quite large size. They have about a million lookup tables, which I talked about. And they have a 6,000 or 7,000 DSPs. These are multiplication accumulation units, right? And they have a lot of distributed RAMs and also so-called block RAMs uh, in the order of 80 megabit. So if you look at on a die photo, so this is where uh, the block RAMs, so all arranged in columns. This is where the DSPs are located. And uh, also there's one place they have a more concentrated, a very large, they call the ultra RAMs. Uh, when this is being introduced into the FPGA uh, F1 cluster in AWS, that's called the uh, that was a state of art FPGA. Right now, it's no longer the last FPGA, the largest FPGA. Uh, so spend a, a dollar to a dollar fifty. You can actually play around it uh, for an hour on AWS. So it's totally accessible. Of course, that they, if you have the interest or the expertise, you can also buy those FPGA cards, the same as the GPU card. You can plug in into uh, the servers, uh, the PCIe chassis, uh, the the same way we use GPU for acceleration. Um, so uh, my group has been working in this space for over two decades. And the, the, actually the effort uh, uh, intensified back in um, two, uh, 2019, uh, 2009, when we get a, an asset expedition in computing award. Um, so you can see this is actually a quote from our proposal. We want to look beyond parallelization and focus on domain specific customization. It was interesting at that time when we, uh, in order to get a award, you have to actually go to Washington to have a reverse site visit, so to speak. The panelist was asking that, uh, what's the domain you can work on? At that time, we couldn't think of uh, <clears throat> deep learning yet. So we, um, the our proposals all focus on medical applications, medical imaging. And uh, um, later on, we also expand into ge uh, genomics acceleration and others. And so we have a, a, a a number of articles that are summarized in our research result. The most recent one was in uh, IEEE proceedings uh, two years ago. So we talk about acceleration at the multiple level, single chip at the server level and the data center level. So I'll give you uh, some flavor of that. Um, the, the first application we have is uh, on deep learning. So we started uh, without knowing uh, Google's effort uh, also around 2014. And uh, however, with IPGA, we're able to get it out at the, in a matter of months, uh, a few months. At the, also, this is the time where we use the um, high-level synthesis technology, which I will talk about later on. You can write C programs. We can compile into hardware directly. So we can evaluate. We're able to evaluate over a thousand design points. And uh, within three months, really, that uh, before the submission, 
Um, so this paper came out uh, uh, 2015. Arguably, I would say it's probably the first deep learning acceleration on IPGAs. There's other uh, work accelerating CNNs in gen, I mean, uh, convolution node that uh, kernels in general, but looking at the deep network, um, this is the first one. It has uh, over 15,000 citations by now. Um, Microsoft take it to a different scale to accelerate deep learning on IPGAs. Um, so they, are not, uh, uh, they published the result um, in micro 2016. Um, now they have an IPJ in every um, service in the data center. The way it works is that uh, for the, um, so you have a CPU um, servers, but that before the CPU goes to the network through the ne network interface card, it can also go through an IPJ and come out. So that's why here you have your uh, CPU plane and then all of them supposed to go to the top of the rack switch and then be connected to the uh, uh, L2 and L1 switch. Now you can all go through an IPGA. So you get actually a, a layer or a plane of accelerators. They are all connected to very fast uh, top of the rack switch and uh, also in general by this layer of a network. So what they can do is that now you can use not only one IPGA to accelerate deep learning, you can use it to uh, multiple of them and you can have a, a one layer or multiple layers on each one of them. Then you don't need to actually even go to DRAM or the SRAMs and uh, the embedded uh, RAM I talked about on the IPGA can store the weight and then do the processing. Uh, they get a very remarkable result that uh, uh, this is a small, relatively small card from uh, Altera nice part of Intel. Um, uh, also, they take the advantage, it's totally customizable. So they use a reduced bit width. This is a nine bit width at P9. They also design their own the, the, uh, bit width, this is MS at P8, right? So you can see the, the performance goes from a, a couple of teraops all the way to 90 teraops. At 90 teraops, in fact, this is quite comparable to a TPU. And this is all done on programmable fabric. So that's why it's uh, very impressive. Um, it's not just uh, deep learning you can accelerate. The beauty with IPGA is you can think about the, any application you can give it a try. So we, in our group has a, a, this publication from uh, uh, last year and uh, on a very classical problem on sorting, which is, uh, um, there's a lot of nice work done in this community. Um, um, the, the very common way to do a large sorting is to use the merge tree, right? And because you can prove it's both compute uh, optimal and also IO optimal. Uh, so there's two important parameters when you build a merge tree is that how many leaves you are going to merge. So that's called the L. And also um, how many elements you produce at the root. That the, so that's uh, uh, the throughput of the tree. Uh, these two you can customize. In fact, at every layer of the tree, you can decide what's the throughput you will have. And this is how do I decide? That depends on, on the data you're going to solve, how large of a data set you're going to solve, and also how uh, what's your memory bandwidth for the FPGAs. So these two uh, become parameters for us, and then depends on the, uh, the DRAM bandwidth that uh, we can actually customize it. Moreover, you can change your mind because when you sort very large data, you really have two levels. One level is actually sorted into the DRAM size, right, 64 gigabyte. And then the next level to merge them further to get the terabyte scale sorting. So the IO bandwidth is actually quite different than for DRAM and SSD. So in our case, we can actually get uh, the phase one is to get one tree that uh, with a, a set of a PNL and then the, the second phase, you get another uh, tree that was a different P, different L. So, and as a result that, that you can totally adapt or customize your hardware that, that for the uh, data side or the memory system you have. So if you look at the ta this table, we compare with the leading uh, CPU sorting engines and the GPU sorting engines and the other FPJ works. So this is uh, now our sorting performance. Um, so in terms of the uh, gigabyte per second, we can sort and uh, we actually goes, uh, have the best result across the board from gigabytes all the way to hundreds of terabytes. Um, 
So not only we have this uh, implemented in the uh, AWS F1, that's actually the, the result we reported. We, one of my students this year also implemented on a, a near storage device that uh, on a Samsung smart SSD. Um, so this is something you can buy in the market that uh, the smart SSD, what it has is that uh, uh, obviously it has the, the flash and uh, also, but before they go to the um, host, you have an option actually to connect to the FPGA on the SSD for processing. So uh, taking advantage of this, then we can actually sort a terabyte scale. And the sorting phase takes 85 seconds. The merging phase that, that takes 100 seconds. Uh, and then the uh, reconfiguration reprogram takes four seconds in total is about uh, uh, 200 uh, seconds. So this is actually 30X faster. You can measure it on the multi-core CPU systems. Um, that's also, uh, some very nice work done in this community. In fact, uh, the chair of our uh, steering committee, uh, Professor Victor Posana's group, has a very impressive work on high throughput uh, hash tables. Um, so they can support uh, multiple or many parallel queries uh, in one clock cycle by taking the advantage, one is the abundant on-chip SRAMs I talked about, and also the customized the, the data, the arrangement. Uh, to avoid the, the conflicts. So you can see this result. Uh, it's actually very impressive. You can sort in the order of uh, 4 billion that uh, queries, that uh, 4 to 5 billion queries uh, per second. So this is by far the, uh, the, the highest performance I've seen. So after seeing these examples, you may wonder says, uh, why that uh, the general person purpose processor is not so competitive. Uh, so um, we can be easily beaten by these accelerators and uh, even though they are on the FPGA fabric. So we did a study back in 2014 just to understand uh, where the inefficiency coming from. So this is one of them. So think of modern auto, auto processor, right? So first you got to fetch the instruction that they're from your uh, L1 cache. So that takes your 9% of energy. And you got to decode it, you find out whether it's an add or a multiplier. So that's another 5%. And uh, you may actually have to go through a renaming stage to uh, minimize the dependency. Uh, so that's 12%. Then you get the data from the register files, that's 3%. Uh, if out of order processor, your data may not be ready. So you wait in some uh, uh, the scheduler. So that's another 11%. So finally, when you are ready to execute, you do it either on integer uh, ALUs or floating point ALUs, and then you write back to the memory. And then you also have a fair amount of a control logic to, this, um, to control these pipeline registers. You can see in auto, uh, all this, what we care about is easier integer operation or floating point operation, right, plus the memory. So that's actually where we're paying, but however, we're paying all this overhead uh, for it to be general purpose. We want to be able to have one pipeline to uh, decode and execute uh, tens of instructions or hundreds of instructions. Um, so there's other source of uh, inefficiencies or maybe another way to put it is that the, the power of customization coming from uh, multiple um, directions. So this is, there's a nice article about this from uh, Professor Bill Dadis group at Stanford. Now he's also with NVIDIA. So he summarized nicely into these five parts, right? That uh, specialized the data type and the operations. And so instead of doing those basic operations um, in one cycle, you can do it that uh, one cycle, you can do many operations. There's massive parallelism that uh, you can see that uh, on IPG, you have this 6,000, 7,000 DSP unit. They can all be uh, up and running that uh, when you have a, a good data parallelism. Uh, there's this optimized memory that uh, I will talk about later on, give you a concrete example when we come to stencil computations. And uh, I talk about the overhead, that uh, there's no overhead. You don't get instruction decode. If you have two add operations, you just add them, right? And a lot of time when you do the accelerator designs, you also think about the adapting the algorithms to that. So altogether, you can see the numbers. It normally gets you somewhere around the 
um, tend to a thousand x improvement. So I talk about the uh, IPG does have overhead over the, the A6, but uh, now model that's in the order of uh, 10x, 20x. So it's still well justified if you can actually move it to the customized logic. Of course, I want to say is that uh, whenever possible, you can do A6 that uh, like TPUs, if you can afford one is the cost, the other one is the time. You have to be patient. It's not going to get it the next day. You have to wait for 12 to 18 months to get it off. So you can say, okay, this is wonderful. Uh, why not everyone's doing this uh, in, in our community? Um, so I'll come to the challenge part that uh, uh, it's very simple. Uh, it's hard to design an IPG. I don't know how many of you have tried. And uh, despite a lot of efforts. Um, so first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about the progress we had in IPG synthesis. There's multi-decades of effort. Uh, I have been very much involved um, in many of, uh, of these, uh, 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 these research topics. So let me highlight a couple of them. One is uh, you may wonder, say, I don't design in lookup tables. Where do I get lookup tables? So back in 1992, we showed a uh, result saying, you give me any Boolean network, actually I can map that to a lookup table network that, uh, that with minimum depths. That, uh, so this actually will be fastest. This is one of the few cases you can do it optimally and also in polynomial time. So this is the flow map algorithm by a series of a network flow computation. So this is actually a cornerstone in almost all the FPGA synthesis tools. So and then the next question you ask is that, okay, that's fine. Where do I get the Boolean networks? Um, so the Boolean networks, actually there's another stage of research we're doing is to use high level synthesis. Um, so uh, we started effort in early 2000. And uh, in fact, we were probably one of the first teams using LVM for hardware compilation. And uh, so we developed a tool called, uh, uh, first called Xpilot. And uh, later on, actually there's a spin-off company Kyra mentioned in the introduction called Auto ESL, which later on was acquired by Zydex. Now it's the largest FPGA companies worldwide. Um, so we were uh, based on C2RTL synthesis, it's platform-based, and then was, we're leveraging our VM framework. So the front end is all the same compilation, elaboration, and the code transformation, but then at the back end, we'll do scheduling, resource finding, resource allocation, and uh, support the full uh, IEEE 754 floating point data types. As, but you can also design any bit ways from uh, four bits, eight bits, all the way to 256 bits, whatever you want, right? And uh, we have a number of innovations involved. For example, there's uh, this uh, scheduling engine based on the uh, system of different constraints, automatic memory partitioning, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, the quality of result uh, matches or exceeds the RTL design. I'll show you an example. And the, this is, if you are interested, it's all captured in a, a IEEE transaction paper back in 2011. Um, so here are some of the results. Before Zadix made the acquisition, they did the extensive test. For example, they take a wireless uh, memo sphere decoder. This is a 4,000 line of C code. And at that time, the leading IPGA was a Vertex 5. They wanted to run at 225 megahertz. Um, so you um, uh, they use high-level synthesis versus manually designed RTL, that, uh, that, uh, the IPs. If you look at the, this comparison, actually in this case, IPJ uh, using high-level synthesis wins uh, in terms of both the lookup table registers and the DSPs and the BRAMs. So this is definitely a very successful uh, example. Um, so, and uh, they made, really made it a, a done a very nice job to uh, make it a, a commercially uh, viable tool called the Vivado HIS. Right now it's renamed to called the Vitus HIS. If you do a Google Scholar search, uh, there's uh, over 5,000 articles that the research papers um, using Vivado HIS. So industry uh, deployment is uh, probably even bigger, but uh, they may not publish it. So he says, that's great. So now I can compile my C programs uh, into FPGAs. So why we're not doing that? Um, so uh, definitely you should do that. But I want to warn you is that not all the C programs give you um, good performance. 
which is not surprising. I think this community knows well, not all C programs give you good performance on CPUs or supercomputers either, right? So, um, so but there's additional challenges coming from FPGAs, let me explain. Um, so you look at, this is actually well known that uh, by now that uh, the CNN code, you get the six layer nested loop uh, to go from input feature map to output feature map. So if you map it to an FPGA, you can just give this code, you have some initialization. So this is a CNN kernel, and then this is the max pooling that the uh, and the uh, relu and the max pooling. If you get it, the good news is that you do get a result right away, but it's 80x slow uh, down compared to a single core CPU. You said, "Wow, that's why that's the case." If you do a little bit the analysis, you will find out there's multiple reasons. First, this is coming in as a function, right? You these variables got mapped to the interface and uh, to the memories. Um, so these variables typically is a uh, uh, 32-bit floating point uh, numbers or 32-bit integers, or you can have a reduced bit width. If you have a reduced bit width, it's even worse because the memory bandwidth is 512, and then you are only using 32-bit at a time to read. So that's actually a fraction of memories. And moreover, that uh, if you don't do anything, that uh, your engine will be reading from the DRAM repeatedly. So there's no that uh, on chip data caching. That, uh, so that's actually a problem. So um, the second problem is that uh, another problem is that uh, when you read the data, you don't do communication. And uh, because uh, the cache is designed in such a way to do a lot of work, nice work in the background, right? So when you design your own accelerator, you have to take care of that. By default, it's not there. And also you look at these loops, this is a nested loops. And if you don't do that, you get actually a sequential execution. Um, so that's a problem. I remember that I said that a PGA could be in the 300, 400 megahertz it will be actually several X slower than the CPU. So this will be a definite disadvantage. And then finally, you map your data into an on-chip memory that uh, is a BRAM or URAM, but this memory only have two ports. And so the maximum degree of parallelism you get is two. Um, so no wonder you cannot get any acceleration. So there's a limited ports on the on-chip memory. But the, these are not fundamental limitations. This is just by the very naive designs that the high-level synthesis has created. And so of course that we're not going to deal with that. And uh, so what we have done is that uh, we are going to, um, for example, we talk about that we're going to partition the memories. That, uh, so these are the parameters, the memory partition. And uh, so we're going to do the, uh, in the parameters to do HLS pipelining. And also we are going to introduce the parameters to do the unroll, which is the parallelization. And uh, then we also do the coarse grain pipelining. So after a number of uh, optimizations, now we are 7,000 X faster than a single thread CPU. I just use a single thread CPU as a reference. Remember early on we were 80 X slower, right? But then now except your uh, 10, 20 lines of a code become 150 lines of a code with 28 paragamas. I think this paragamas present a major barrier to a lot of a uh, software program to use this tool because they have to know how you parallel and pipeline the architecture, how do you partition the memories? Um, so, so that's why I'm saying is that not everyone's trained to perform this kind of optimization. Um, but here also comes with the opportunities whenever you see these problems. So this has been a, something that my group has been working on in the, in the past decade or so. There's also a lot of a nice effort from the community. So I describe this effort in three areas. One is that uh, we do architecture directed optimization. Um, then we do also general design space exploration. Um, and then finally, I'll tell you how do we further raise the level of abstraction, not to stay with C programs, but we can go to, uh, for example, uh, TensorFlow, uh, Highlight, and other level, uh, high level DSLs. So let's start with architecture optimization. Uh, Oh, I can actually come back to this chart later on. So this is actually a nice overview about our effort to make it uh, uh, more efficient. So we're going to start from this high-level DSLs and eventually come to very efficient 
IPT and through high performance, right? Uh, through this uh, uh, special architectures what we do have. So, um, so now our goal is to, I call that democratize IPG acceleration design. And not only a few on the special uh, EECS people can do that. I really want every CS programmers to be able to do that. In fact, I teach that um, uh, two classes. One is a graduate level class uh, on customized computing, but I also teach an undergraduate level class uh, called the uh, parallel distributed computing, where I have a two weeks dedicated on this. So students can actually use the tools we have now to do, uh, for example, CNN designs and uh, on uh, AWS F1. Um, so, um, but the, with help of some of these more advanced tools. So first, uh, um, let me show you that uh, what we can do with uh, uh, architecture guided optimization. The first is we can do the, the you know, systolic rate designs, uh, which is getting a, a lot of attention recently, although it's a rather uh, old concept and started from uh, license and Chrome um, back in the 1980s. Um, so where you want to have is that you want to have only the nearest neighbor computation, right, that between the different PEs. Um, but it's easy said and done that uh, you have to make sure that how do I make sure, uh, how do I decide what data is communicated, what uh, between the PEs, what data is uh, uh, accumulated within the PEs, which direction should I communicate, and do I get a 1D PE or 2D PE, and also in general, how do I know if an application uh, can be mapped to a systolic array. So now uh, we have this tool called Auto SA. It's fully uh, open source. You can download it. Just adding uh, one pragma basically uses a uh, uh, pragma uh, scope. Uh, the reason you scope, we use the polyhedral model. Um, and then this nested C loops can be compiled into a systolic array. Not only just one, we can actually compile into millions of the systolic arrays and pick up the, the best ones for you. Um, I can tell you how we get started uh, back in 2014. Uh, oh, by the way, I should mention that the Google TPU is also using a systolic array. So uh, without knowing that back in the 2014, that one graduate student looking at the systolic design manually. He spent about five months, and this is on IPGA, and uh, you end up with 17,000 lines of a code. Just do a simple matrix modification design. At the end, we do get a very good result that the, uh, this is about 200 giga uh, flops that uh, on the planning uh, VC7 series IPGA. Um, so of course, recently, as I said, they're getting a lot of attention that the Google TPUs in the IPGA world, both Intel and as uh, they have the IPGAs. However, if you look at this uh, published result from Intel, uh, design system rate is not easy. That uh, they show uh, actually the effort um, it's somewhere uh, between uh, six, uh, three months, all the way to 18 months to do this algorithm, even on FPGAs. So that's why we want to uh, um, accelerate that, uh, automate the uh, uh, facility, the process. Uh, although there's a number of accelerate uh, algorithm designs, but in terms of the compilation tools, there are relatively few. Uh, um, one is that, uh, so I list a few, this is actually from uh, the first one is from Arisa uh, uh, in France and the second one from Ohio State and the same group they developed a Pluto design as probably some people in this community is using that. The next three was actually all from uh, where we're involved. The first, our first efforts called the poly essay using polyhedral model. Later on, I'll have a collaboration with Cornell and uh, um, Intel, it had, uh, another tool called the SUSI, a loss manual designs. And then the final one is the one I'm going to um, talk about. So you can actually compare these tools in multiple dimensions. One is the generality that the, what kind of uh, loops you can handle. And uh, some of the tools can handle only perfectly nested loops, which means you only have one statement in the nested loop in the kernel. And uh, some of them actually can handle uh, multiple statements. By the way, don't be too disappointed if you only handle one uh, statement in the kernel, right? Matrix multiplication, CNNs, all fits into that category. Even you can do that, you can cover a, a big class of a design space. In order to get a good performance, you have to think about the latency hiding, double buffering, a number of techniques. So we also look at the, what they support. And uh, finally, in the per, uh, design productivity, as I said, 
uh, uh, once something can be mapped to Cicero grid, that's not just the one uh, design point. You can actually have millions of design points. How do you pick the best one? Uh, many of them actually um, does not offer you that flexibility. You have to pick manually. So um, the auto essay I'm going to talk about in the moment is actually uh, have all these dimensions covered. So how did it work? Actually, we actually uh, decomposed it into multiple steps. First is that we're going to do the legality check. We talked about the, what kind of a C program can be mapped to Cisar grid. You have to make sure that they have a set of loops with dependency zero or one. So this could go to the space loop. The rest, you can go to the time loop. Um, and then there's two parts which are all important. The one is how do you design the PEs? The other one is that how do you design the communication network? So that's actually the two parts I'm going to talk about. Finally, it's a code generation. We can do it either for Xilinx IPGAs or for Intel IPGAs. And then we can also generate the general uh, the high level synthesis tool uh, for ASIC designs or for some of these vendor tools. Um, as I said, uh, uh, the representation, internal representation we use is the polyhedral model. Uh, for this community, I probably don't need to have too much of an uh, introduction. You have a nested loop that defines an iteration space and you have dependencies in this iteration space. You can traverse in this uh, uh, polyhedron any way you want. Just make sure that uh, you actually will uh, uh, preserve the dependency. Um, this polyhedron model is actually very useful that, uh, because you give me this matrix multiplication example, there's actually multiple dependencies. For example, uh, you have a C array being accumulated from AIK to BKJ, right? So this first you have a, a read after read dependency. And uh, so that's one dependency I put it here as so a group one and the read after read dependency again, a group two. Here that uh, uh, you have, uh, you read the previous value of a C, you write it to the current ones. So this is a, a read after write dependency. So that's actually the third class. And then finally you have the write after write dependency. So what we can use is that based on these dependencies, we can decide how we generate the network. For example, this read after read dependency is in this dimension. So we are going to generate the data network, data communication in this dimension. And also the second one is actually in this X dimension, right? One, zero, zero, zero. So that's why how we generate this network. And then finally, when you read it out, and then this is actually, we look at this one. So that's actually uh, one way we um, uh, use the uh, polyhedral model to do the dependency analysis, help us to design the network. The second important concept we have in our compilers, we uh, decouple the compute and communication. So in the computation part, we will do the space-time mapping uh, array partitioning, latency hiding, uh, a CMB vectorization. And here we're going to do the uh, IO analysis, uh, IO construction, um, IO um, optimization. This is by itself is a whole talk. I will skip some of the details, but I'll give you one example. Um, so you ha we have this nested loops. So first we have to, to do so-called the space-time mapping. We have to decide which set of loops goes to the spatial arrays. You have 1D or 2D arrays, right? So that should be spread out to get, uh, be kept computed on that array. And then which loops will be mapped temporarily and um, on each PE. So this, you have a number of options. So we're going to explore. That's why it says you don't get one array, you get a multiple systolic arrays. Most likely your data is way too large to fit uh, all on a single array. So you have to do a, a partitioning. So basically it's a tiling. So uh, if you, your design can only afford a four by four array, so you should generate the four by four tiles and then repeatedly execute on that. And however, also in some cases, you don't have this very nice single clock execution. You do something, you send it to the next neighbor. You may take 10, 11 clocks for floating point operation. So what do you do in other cases that, uh, that your ne next neighbor? So what you want to do is that you do the latency hiding so you actually want to start multiple parallel executions within the, the independent parallel executions so you can hide the latency. Um, so there's that level of optimization to further refine the loops. 
finally, that uh, you don't want to just pass, do a computation of one number and pass it over. We may want to do it for eight numbers, 16 numbers. So that's where the SIMD architecture comes in. So these are all parameters you can tune. For example, should I be uh, a way SIMD or 16 way SIMD? And uh, it depends on, the, for example, the bit width where you're doing a bit computation or 16 bit computation, 64 bit computation. Um, so we also allow you to have a, a, a user input. For example, you can decide, I want a tiling factor to be 16, 16, 16, which the first two 16s are for the spatial uh, array and the, the final one is for the temporal, right? And uh, if you have no knowledge, we'll do the automatic tuning for you. Um, so they give you some sense about the automatic tuning you have, uh, we have. So if you look at this three level nested loop for matrix multiplication, fortunately they are all either distance one or distance zero. So we can actually fully permute them when we do the DNA space exploration. So here right away you get six possibilities. And then you want to, uh, for each committed uh, permutation ordering, you can actually do different tilings, right? So that the subarray sizes, um, they can be the, uh, the factors of the loop permutation, or it can be any numbers you want to have. Um, so that's why you can easily get uh, tens of thousands of configurations. Um, so let me tell you some experimental result. This is all uh, uh, fully implemented and as I said, open source. The, the tuner is written, uh, the Python, the compiler itself is in C. Um, so uh, these are the, some of the computational kernels we try. They can be all mapped to systolic arrays. Um, so what's interesting is that we can generate uh, either uh, 1D array or 2D array. For example, if you look at this one, it's, I call that uh, output stationary uh, because uh, you have a, uh, memory that actually buffer C to accumulate the result as you go. Another case is that uh, uh, I call that input stationary. And uh, your result is actually passed to the next neighbors for accumulation. Um, all of them are possible. Um, also that uh, um, for, I just picked the three different data flows and the configurations I showed you you can see that the performance we get is actually uh, can be different, right? We're going to explore that, but the best one we have you know, all the way uh, close to one uh, terra ops operations that, uh, per second. Um, so this shows you that the uh, data flow choices on a, a CNN, this is a, a, the Google um, the, the network, right? It has actually uh, if you look at the CNN layers, it has nine layers. Uh, this is a VGG network. So we can, a VGG 16 network. So we can actually come up with a customized accelerator for each one. And of course, later on, we're going to also merge them to come up with the best choice. So you can see in some early layers, you actually want to prefer one uh, 1D configuration in some uh, later layers that you use a different configuration. Um, so this is the comparison all the way, if you look at the, the Terra Ops operations, uh, for 8-bit integer, we can get to close to seven uh, Terra Ops. So this is the best performing uh, system upgrade over all the publications on the FPGA. And that is fully automated. Um, there's also other kernels, which I will skip that, that we can also do uh, very competitively. You look at the DSP, this is a Mac accumulate unit and utilization where uh, close to being fully, fully utilized. Uh, as I said, it's fully uh, open source. I encourage you to try that. Actually, I have introduced it in my graduate class. There's projects being done on top of this. So the second example I want to give it to you is on the, the um, stencil computation. Um, so this is actually a good way to uh, tell you something about the memory optimization, customization. So we all familiar with the stencil computation where you want to update one uh, pixel based on the nearby pixels, right? Uh, this is widely used in image processing. So what's the challenge? The challenge is that uh, if you do this, if you want to do this update uh, based on this uh, all in one clock cycle, you have to make sure that all these elements 
you can access, they got to be in different memory banks, right? So this is just to do one pixel update in a single clock cycle. It's possible you want to do three updates, right? And then you have to make sure these uh, 11 pixels are all in different memory banks. So this is actually a very challenging problem for you to do the design. So, uh, and then you want to, and also not only at one data point as this moves that you want to make sure you never run into the problem. And also the stencil can be iterative stencil, right? You can, after one iteration, pass to the next iteration. Uh, obviously the image is very large, you cannot, uh, just have one uh, set of PE to do that, you've got to do the tiling. So if you think about the tiling, the number of PEs, and also the iterations you will do, so it's a fairly large design space as well. So this is actually a very interesting case. We can come up with a totally customized designs. You can see what we have is by a set of a fine clothes and uh, basically represent the, the reuse buffers and the reuse buffers of a different lengths. Because if you look at the stencil computation, some of the real distance is very small if you are just the next one in the same line, but it can also be wrapped around being reused again. So some real distance is much longer. By this customized designs, we can guarantee you that to have a minimum off-chip memory access and also minimum on-chip buffer, which is something you cannot achieve uh, with CPUs or even GPUs. Um, and not only the, the, the customized memory designs, if you look at the, uh, the stencil computation, for one stencil computation, really there's uh, no reuse. You have to add up all these four points, right? And divide it by some constant. However, if you wait for a number of iterations, when you come to the, this stencil, they actually share an edge. This edge, if you want, you can save and they're being reused. And the, I'm just showing you a very small stencil. You can think about the much bigger stencil patterns. You can actually have a lot of uh, reuse opportunities. So in that case, and uh, we can also imp uh, implement efficiently on IPJ with customization. So this is some comparisons we have. And uh, so the last two bars are what we have that uh, uh, we, for example, the ones, so without, uh, with computation reuse and the without, uh, without computation reuse or with computation reuse. And the, this middle bar is the, uh, the GPUs, um, Tesla P100. The reason we pick this true IPGA and the GPUs is that they all on 14 nanometer process. So we want to compare the uh, IPGA and the GPUs in the same technology mode, at the same technology mode. So uh, uh, IPGA has better performance in most of the cases, and except for this one, I look at it, this one has very large stencils. And, uh, so GPU and uh, the parallelism actually was quite effective. This one had a better performance um, compared to the IPGA implementation. So these are two examples of what I call architecture uh, directed optimization. Now you may say, what about the general C programs I have? It may not actually have these nice patterns, which I understand. So that's why we actually had an effort that, uh, to look at the optimization for general C program. In fact, this started also a research project later on to become a spin off company from UCI called the Falcon Computing, just last year being acquired by Zilinx. So what they have is actually uh, a way to insert pragmas that uh, more efficiently or, other, uh, um, or automatically compared to the high level synthesis tool. Um, so it's a very simple compilation flow. You write your C, C++ programs, you mark what is the kernel and the going through the compilation tool, they will actually having part of that to be executed on host and the part of that to be executed on IPGA. And this connection, uh, the data transfer is taken care of automatically. Uh, so it's a much higher degree of uh, automation, that's one. Another thing is that in terms of programming model, I think it should, uh, this community should appreciate more is that very similar to, for example, the well-known that the uh, OpenMP model. So we, we know that we can do a, a pragma ONP parallel. Um, so they I just have basically two pragmas, uh, the pragma Excel parallel, pragma Excel pipeline. So these are the main things that they, you can make use of that. And uh, so, with these two programmers, you can actually do a, a, a lot of acceleration. 
Um, so that's something you have to specify these two parameters. Behind the scene, under the hood, you will do a number of optimizations, which I talked about, uh, automatic memory banking, partitioning, right, uh, delinearization, and uh, memory burst, uh, the streaming, and also the generate host and the, uh, the IPGA code uh, on top using OpenCL as the backend. You can also have the uh, advanced options for the parallel program. You can specify the reduction or stencil variables. So um, this gives us a, a much higher productivity. Um, um, so I think it's actually have been open source a lot of uh, HRS libraries to allow people to use uh, in our C programs. So there's one set of libraries for the open CV vision applications. So uh, uh, for, this is a result from Falcon Computing. They actually compare the Merlin compilers. On average, those uh, vision kernels has over 20 programs when you write it using high-level synthesis. When you use it right using Merlin, it's somewhere between one to two programs. And uh, this is actually uh, about the same performance. You can see that uh, very much the same. So I introduced this tool in my uh, graduate level class, CS259 back in 2019. So you can see the students um, use 27 programmers that are using high level synthesis. When you come to Merlin, they use nine. In fact, nine is redundant for this design. This is digital recognition. We can get it down, get it by with one or two programmers. Uh, so this is a 3X reaction, but moreover, when you have a, a smaller design space, uh, they get a better design. So that's a 4X better performance in general. Um, so I talked about the acquisition. Uh, I was talking to, uh, I've been encouraging that adding stasis, you should open source this tool because this is a source to source transformation. You can take C, C++ code. They can generate a much better optimized HIS C code. And uh, they find, uh, they actually agree that uh, um, they give me this link. Uh, it's not quite ready yet. It's going through the legal review. So you can come back to check there. So the compiler, because uh, it's a spin off from UCI, I, uh, I was uh, involved, so I'm very familiar. It actually makes use of the ROSE compiler. So um, it's totally extendable. Um, but it, we still, uh, oh, one thing I want to uh, mention is that uh, using the Merlin compiler is actually introduced a new class of architectures. I call that the CPP architectures, customizable um, parallel and pipeline architecture. Um, so what it has is that uh, it basically has a store compute and uh, uh, load store compute that uh, this organization, which is very similar to the general purpose CPU, but it, you can totally customize you know, the data be with and the memory partitioning and so on and so forth. The main compute unit, you can nest it, the parallelization and the pipelining, right? So you can parallelize and within each module you can uh, pipeline and within each pipeline stage you can parallelize again. So that's why I call that the composable, right? That the uh, uh, parallel pipeline architecture. Um, so given the time, I want to move quickly to uh, the last topic is that, uh, so now our goal, I can tell you is uh, zero program that uh, you still have one or two early on. So we are building an automatic search engine uh, with some AI uh, capabilities on top of that uh, to do the design space. So what do we have is that uh, we have an explorer, which has a, a number of heuristics. For example, one is on the bottleneck uh, based optimization. Some of them using reinforcement learning. The objective can be performance that the area and the trade-off both, right? So we do design space generation and also exploration, uh, the partition and the exploration. Um, as we explore, we have a database, we accumulate what design point we have seen and that we don't have the redundant generation. And uh, obviously we got to evaluate what's the, uh, the best design. So we can either run a, a high level synthesis automatically, or we can actually build a, a, a neural network based models. In this case, we use uh, GCNs, the, the graph based neural network models. Um, so um, one heuristic we use is called a battle, uh, bottleneck based optimization. It's actually very intuitive. It's like how we tune program. So you run it, you profile, you say, wow, this loop takes 80% of the time. Let me parallelize that one. So it's the same idea that you run it once and you can go in to look at the sections. 
which takes most of the time you prioritize and pipeline. And you do this iteratively. And uh, the result is actually very encouraging with that, that uh, we tried on the same uh, 33 kernels in the same set of uh, vision libraries I talked about. So for these 33 kernels, there's about uh, 13, 14 that, uh, pragmas on average. We're able to get rid of uh, all of them. And then we get the performance. So this is a reference one, right? Um, actually comparable to manual design for almost all of them. There are some exceptions that you can see that here and here actually we get a 2X or 3X lower performance just because in some cases uh, you hope that they say pipeline that, that they can figure out the minimum initiation interval, but you cannot. So there's something we're still working with science. But there's also cases we can get much better performance because there's another dimensional loop you can pipeline or parallel the human data are missed. That's why we can get a 60,000 X speed up and the, or that the 30 X speed up because when those uh, loop dimension is very high, you can get a lot of speed up. Um, um, we, we, excuse me, Jason, we do have a few questions. So I wanna be sure we have time. Of course, yeah. So this is something uh, we have and then I will actually, um, that uh, without mentioning these ones is that uh, using the neural network model, we are actually making sure that we can explore more points. So now we're at a stage we can uh, explore about uh, a couple hundred configurations per second. So finally, I like to talk about the ways we support that uh, uh, this uh, um, high level uh, DSLs, for example, Spark, Halide and other programs. And the way we have, we, we are doing that is actually we have the front end compiler. We compile into something we call that uh, uh, intermediate representation. Um, so this is, uh, uh, and then from there we go to this uh, architecture optimization. Uh, so this uh, intermediate representation is the Hydro CL program, which we developed jointly with Professor Drew John's group at Cornell. It allows us to compile these programs into uh, this into, uh, into Hydro CL program, which has a unique uh, feature advantage. Remember, I showed you the program. We have uh, uh, algorithms, and then you enter the paragraphs. So in this design, we actually very much inspired or influenced by Halide. We separate algorithm description and the optimization. So this is called a scheduling function. And you can do the compute customization, data customization, and memory customization. Um, given the interest of the time, I will not go into details, but this is also a fully open source project. We have collaboration from other universities and industries. For example, Intel is very much a partner. And uh, so we have some detailed examples to show you how that's being done. And now we actually have the backend to go to the Merlin and also auto essay and the soda for the, uh, the compiler part. So these are some of the results. Um, so there's other effort we make FPG easier, for example, to have a complete compilation flow from tensor uh, flow to FPGAs to do task level parallelization. Uh, to support uh, legacy code in, in terms of pointers and recursion, and also performance uh, debugging. Uh, so I leave some references for the, uh, for the audience here. So the final uh, concluding remark I want to make is that uh, I think in uh, Hennessy and Patterson's uh, Turing Award lecture, they, they are saying we are at the golden age of a computer architect, which is absolutely agree. Well, my goal and our goal is to want to make sure that every programmers, not just the computer architects can participate. You got to be able to come in to design your own customized architectures and uh, all feel programmable fabrics. So you can actually see the result in hours or uh, days and the, either on premise or in the cloud. And uh, I hope many of you can uh, join this effort. So with that, I, I want to thank the funding agencies from NSF, uh, Chris, uh, center and uh, our CDIC industry partners. This is uh, obviously will not be possible without uh, many years of effort from uh, students, postdocs, and collaborators. So I'd be happy to stay uh, stop here and take questions. Let's thank our speaker, although he can't hear us clapping uh, in this virtual world. Uh, we do have a few questions on the board. 
Uh, one from Eric Soul. Where should a graduate student with knowledge in HPC start to learn how to use FPGAs with HLS tools? Um, so that's an excellent question. That uh, uh, first, uh, in terms of HLS tools, um, Zadings has a very nice uh, tutorial and set of materials, and uh, they have made it available on the website. And uh, I direct my graduate student to look at them. And some of these uh, more advanced research level tools, and uh, we try to make it very informative. For example, auto essay, we have very nice tutorial pages. It's all open source. There's examples you can run that. Um, uh, there, for example, there's a group of physicists that are interested in using that and give a tutorial there. And my students can give a tutorial. Just the very last week that uh, this FCCM conference uh, between Intel, uh, Cornell, and UCLA, we give a tutorial how do you design system arrays using high level synthesis? So there's these kind of uh, events available as well. Um, and if you send me email, I can give you more pointers. Great, thank you. Uh, one more, could you comment on the time it takes for compilation? Is that a bottleneck for development and what could be done about it? Absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. it's a very good question. So uh, this is something I did not get the chance to actually talk about the much is that if you look at this list is that, um, so first you can use high level synthesis tool to iterate. It's not going to be as fast as uh, uh, C compilers or OpenMP compilers, but uh, you will be, most of the time will be up in a, uh, a few minutes. However, when you do the placement and routing, that really takes time. Sometimes it's hours and we have seen cases goes tens of hours. Um, so we have an effort to reduce the um, actually physical uh, design time by parallelization. Uh, there's a lot of interaction. The trick is that uh, I think key is to how do you decouple the design? And uh, in fact, this is where I hope this community can help because you have tremendous experience doing uh, uh, high quality parallel and distributed computing. Uh, we need that. And, uh, so, but this is a, a very active research topic and research area. And uh, my group at least is uh, actively working on that. So now our goal is probably uh, too ambitious to get it done the, in the odd minutes, but we hope that it can be half an hour or an hour that the, over a lunch break, you can see our design. Great. Uh, finally, one final question. Um, uh, one alternative to FPGAs are CGRAs, coarse-grained reconfigurable architectures, and they seem to be regaining popularity. For example, uh, Zillix Versal, Cerebris, et cetera. Could you briefly describe your view on the role of FPGAs uh, and CGRAs in the future computing? Great. So uh, excellent question. That uh, so um, I think FPGA is evolving. And uh, remember that uh, uh, I, here I says I hope everyone can be able to build his uh, her own accelerator on field programmable fabrics. I didn't commit to field programmable accelerator. The reason is that uh, for example the FPGA today maybe is too fine grained that you have lookup tables, can input six input functions, and the seven input functions. Uh, but a lot of time we do computation in a bit, 16 bits, right? They do have DSPs in that uh, uh, sort of a, that level of abstraction, but whether we can do more. So that's uh, a great question is that we want to find out the right trade-off. It can allow you to have enough of a programmability, but also has high enough of efficiency. So this reference to Verso is a, a, a very good one. For example, the latest lighting side PGA, they have this uh, fine grain fabrics, they have DSPs. They also has an array of so-called AI engines, uh, which we are trying to make use of that. And in fact, one interesting project we are doing is to map systolic arrays to those AI engines. So I expect that PGAs will be, um, you know, continue to evolve. And the, their original usage was really for control, a lot of, uh, communication, usage, data processing. Now, if you are going to be used as a computing fabric, I think some new, uh, uh, some adjustment and optimization got to be done. Great. Well, thank you so much again. And thank you again for coming back after we had to cancel uh, last year. Uh, we have to cut off due to time, uh, but again, thank you so much, Dr. Kong, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. My pleasure.